It's a great honor and pleasure for me to welcome Professor Barbara Parkey with us. Uh, Professor Barbara Parkey is, as you all know, a uh, leading linguist and semanticist uh, from the University of Massachusetts in Amherst. Uh, she's an uh, honorary doctor of Charles University and awardee of several prestigious uh, awards and research awards. Uh, but I should say that, um, I hope you allow me to say that she is also a very good friend of us. And we already have had pleasure to have her in Prague several times, even before the year 1989, I should say, and several times after that. But the last time when she was here was 10 years ago. And I was very pleased to uh, hear that Prague is her first overseas trip after the two years of COVID. So we are really honored to have this occasion to welcome you here in, in, in Prague. Uh, she will have two talks uh, in our Monday seminars. One is today on semantic predicate, and the other is next Monday at the same time on lexicological issues. She also has another talk on Thursday at two o'clock at the uh, Institute of Philosophy of Academy of Sciences in Yale-Scar Street. So you certainly uh, will be welcome if somebody wants to listen to that uh, more semantically, former semantically. Um, uh, psychologism and anti-psychologism in the history of formal semantics. Okay. So welcome, welcome here, welcome online, because I am sure we have many listeners uh, online. And now, Barbara, the floor is yours. Well, thank, thank you so much, Eva, for that introduction. I have to thank Eva and also uh, Magda Shev Shevchikova for organizing this seminar uh, and inviting me here. Uh, it, and it's wonderful to be in Prague again after such a long time. I have such close ties here. I have to say it's not the same without Peter Skull here. Excuse me. But it's still wonderful to see so many dear friends and colleagues and to meet new ones. So today's talk represents work done jointly with Lila Gleitman of the University of Pennsylvania. Um, she just died this past August, just after we had finished the paper. And, and that was a terrible loss. Um, the paper has been submitted to language. It's under review. In fact, the first reviews came just before I caught my plane to Prague. So I haven't had a chance to study them yet. But um, so, so questions and suggestions will be very welcome because it's, there's going to have to be changes, I know, to the paper. Okay, so uh, let me see. Uh, so, so, yeah, so symmetry is a property uh, that plays a role in many domains of human cognition and in nature in general. The familiar logical definition of symmetry as a property of binary relations is given in formula one. A relation R, a binary relation R, is symmetrical if and only if for all elements A and B or X and Y, if R X Y then R Y X. In English and not only, there's a kind of, of two-part litmus test for the symmetricals. This was developed by Lila and her colleagues. If they surface in intransitive structures, such as John and Bill are similar, or John and Bill match, or John and Bill hug, uh, then the sentential subject has to be plural, uh, and the meaning is roughly reciprocal. The differences between reciprocals and the intransitive construction is a detail we'll mention later, uh, but they're approximately reciprocal in meaning. So if you try to do it with a singular, just John is similar, 
either it's infelicitous or it has a different interpretation, either anaphoric or there might be a different meaning for the one place predicate. But, but with the same meaning as in, as in A, you don't get singular subjects. Here we want to look at real and apparent mismatches among three things. The logical definition, that linguistic litmus test that categorizes predicates as symmetrical or not in natural language, and judgments offered by native speakers about whether sentences have symmetrical interpretations or not. Our goal is to diagnose the mismatches and in trying to explain them, to get a better handle on the interplay of lexical meaning, syntactic structure, context, and the pragmatic effects of a speaker's choosing to use one syntactic structure rather than another with the same predicate. One big problem early on came from the psychologist Amos Tversky, uh, who argued in an influential 1977 paper that the crucial predicate similar, which plays such a role in all psychological studies, is not itself symmetrical on the grounds of a significant difference in what experimental subjects said about uh, the following two statements. North Korea is similar to Red China versus Red China is similar to North Korea. People did not give identical judgments about the degree to which they agreed with those sentences. So Gleitman and her colleagues in a 1996 paper responding to Tversky showed how the judgments about those sentences can be explained as, a re as resulting from putting a symmetrical lexical item, like similar, which is lexically symmetrical, into an asymmetrical syntactic structure, like this, the subject predicate structure of A and B. Extending that work and other work since then, we first argue for classing predicates, verbs, nouns, adjectives, prepositions, by a combination of logical and linguistic criteria. What we call the pure symmetricals are those that are symmetrical by both the logical definition at the beginning and the litmus test that Lightman had all developed. Those are predicates like equal, similar, match, cousin. An interesting class, which we call the mixed symmetricals, or sometimes we call them the plus or minus symmetricals, behave linguistically like symmetricals by the litmus test, but logically they have both symmetrical and asymmetrical instances uh, like kiss, hug, friend. So if John kisses Mary, Mary may or may not kiss John and there may or may not be a single event of them kissing each other. So it's, it, kiss, kiss can be symmetrical or not, but it's, it passes the litmus test. John and Mary kissed is, is approximately reciprocal in meaning. Uh, and John kissed all by itself is a little bit anomalous. And by synthesizing logical and linguistic perspectives and identifying both lexical and syntactic contributions to the inferences between sentences, we may contribute to a possible resolution of a range of further puzzles that arise when you start working on symmetrical predicates. And we close with a brief look at some striking findings about symmetrical predicates in an emerging sign language, Nicaraguan sign language, that casts interesting further uh, light on differences between the plain symmetrical construction and a reciprocal construction. So, Starting with some logic background, the standard logical definitions of the family of terms symmetrical, asymmetrical, and non-symmetrical uh, are given in four. They're, they're in the, the textbook that, that I wrote with Alistair Mullen and Bob Wall, but they're in many other textbooks in the same way. A relation is symmetrical if and only if for all x, y, if r, x, y, then r, y, x. That's the same as what I said in one. It's asymmetrical if for all x, y, if r, x, y, then not r, y, x. So never, right? And non-symmetrical just means not symmetrical. So not always, if, if r, x, y, then, then not always r, y, x. On this definition, notice that non-symmetrical just means not symmetrical. And the three classes do not form a partition of all the relevant cases. 
the asymmetrical relations are a subclass of the non-symmetrical ones. And there's no standard name for what we might call the middle class or the plus and minus class, the ones that, are, that have some symmetrical instances, some asymmetrical instances. So there's an alternative definition for non-symmetrical, which would make it a partition. Um, so Lemon, for instance, 1965 logic book, defines non-symmetrical as neither symmetrical nor asymmetrical, which is different from just saying not symmetrical. Right? On that definition, non-symmetrical picks out the exact, exactly the middle class, the relations that are neither symmetrical nor asymmetrical, like love and hug and friend of. There are competing advantages to the two different definitions, but, but only this alternative choice gives a three-way partition of relations into exhaustive and non-overlapping classes of symmetrical, asymmetrical, and the middle or plus minus class. For our purposes, this alternative definition is more useful linguistically and probably more natural conceptually than the standard definition I gave earlier. But to avoid confusion, to avoid putting this non-standard definition of a standard term in general use, we'll use the more mnemonic terms, middle class or plus minus class for in what follows for, for, the, for the ones that have both symmetric and asymmetric instances. And we won't mess with the standard definitions of symmetrical, non-symmetrical, asymmetrical. When talking about a plus or minus relation like love, it's tempting to say, and students often say this when you're first teaching about symmetry, that sometimes it's symmetrical and sometimes it's asymmetrical. I mean, you might say that about love. <laughs> too, right? uh, or it has both symmetrical and asymmetrical instances. But according to the definitions, symmetrical and asymmetrical are properties of relations with a universal quantifier built into the definition. And it should not make sense to apply those terms to instances or to say that a relation has such a property sometimes because the property itself is defined as always the one entails the other. Um, and yet it's clear what's meant by those locutions. So we can give supplementary definitions to extend the terminology in these useful ways. You know, instead of just correcting our students all the time, we can say, yes, those are useful notions, but we need a different, different way of talking about them. So we can define a symmetrical instance of a relation R as a pair of elements A and B, such that A are B and B are A. And we can define an asymmetrical instance as one where A are B and B and not B are A. And if one says sometimes love is symmetrical uh, or love has symmetrical instances, that can be defined as saying there are pairs A and B such that A loves B and B loves A. So we put an existential quantifier in instead of the standard universal one. So as I observed in an earlier paper on this topic, with definitions of symmetrical and asymmetrical instances, symmetry could be treated as a graded property of relations. One relation can be more symmetrical than another if it has a higher proportion, say, of symmetrical instances. Lightman et al. treated symmetrical and asymmetrical as sharp concepts, as they are under the standard logical definitions. But they also showed experimentally that when you ask subjects their, their judgments about how symmetrical various predicates are, they readily give rankings in terms of kind of degrees of symmetrical uh, that various relational predicates have. So in section four, we consider the usefulness of graded symmetry in semantically classifying predicates, but for our purposes, we find it uh, sufficient to find several discrete subclasses of predicates with respect to symmetry properties, rather than just a, a general scale. All these considerations suggest that the standard logical definitions of symmetrical and its relatives, they're, they're undoubtedly, I mean, they're clearly very useful, but by themselves, they're a little too limited for linguists' concerns. Common usage offers clues to further notions that are descriptively and perhaps explanatorily valuable. So onto the apparent mismatches. 
are some symmetrical and near, sorry, are similar and near, really symmetrical. What if it turned out very generally with respect to words formally characterized as symmetrical, according to the logical definition, that our usage of those words in natural language doesn't really appear to respect the entailment that that definition states. If a core symmetrical predicate just is similar, violates one, principle one, that would be serious trouble, suggesting a deep disconnect between the abstract logical definitions and notions needed in the study of language and cognition. And that was the heart of the challenge raised in Tversky 1977, that judgments about similarity statements, in judgments about similarity statements, laboratory participants appear to violate the definition of logical symmetry. And his conclusion was that similar is not a psychologically symmetrical concept. So his experiment, he would ask subjects to assess the degree to which say North Korea is similar to red China and they, they would give some judgment. And then he would ask them to assess the degree to which red China is similar to North Korea, and they would give some judgment, often lower. Uh, and, and the conclusion seemed to be that X is more similar to Y than Y is to X, which doesn't fit the notion of symmetry, right? Uh, okay, so uh, Tversky, on Tversky's idea, on his model, objects, a and B are characterized by sets of features that describe them. And the similarity between A and B is computed as a weighted function of three different sets of features. First, the intersection, the, the set of all the features they share, then the set of features that A has and B does not, and the set of features that B has and A does not. Um, the formula doesn't show up very well, but never mind. It's a formula with, with different weighting factors assigned to the function applied to those three things. So in his contrast model, he held that featural descriptions organized by any nominal concept, including proper names like North Korea and Red China, um, that, that, uh, that featural descriptions organize all of these nominal concepts. And similarity was taken to involve comparison of these feature descriptions. And it was not necessarily symmetrical because the weighting parameters applied to the features in A minus B can be different from the weighting parameter for the features in B minus A. Um, and now a generation or more of psychologists came to believe that similar is not a symmetrical concept. And if that wasn't, it's hard to see what would be. And as noted by, by Gleitman and their colleagues and various other people, this is a much more general phenomenon. So tell me, for instance, notice that we're much more likely to want to say the bicycle is near the building than to say the building is near the bicycle. Uh, and and uh, Lakoff and Robin Lakoff in the paper noted that we're more likely to say pink is like red than to say red is like pink. Uh, and, and others have noted that there's a, some perceived difference between my sister met Meryl Streep and Meryl Streep met my sister, or the button matched the shirt and the sh or the shirt matched the button. You know, it's kind of, kind of like which comes first or which is taken as a standard, something like that. Um, and here, here is a nice example from Gleitman et al. Uh, assess the degree to which the least of the citizens is equal to the president. Uh, and, and what's, what's nice is that this, this example, people tend to associate with a president like Abraham Lincoln, and that's a nice moral precept about democracy. If you say the president is equal to the least of the citizens, that tends to evoke a very different kind of president, actually. That's, um, it's not, the sentence is not wrong, it just seems to say something different. Um, and and uh, Chestnut and Markman noted the important social difference of the different ways of phrasing sentences with symmetrical predicates. Girls are as smart as boys, makes a statement that, that they're, they're equally smart. Uh, and it appears, it's often taken as saying something positive about girls, right? Um, the problem is that it has the presupposition that boys are the, setting the standard. And you notice that when you see 
aha, suppose we just said boys are as smart as girls. Yeah. Um, bicycle is near the next to the building, standard case. Um, Gleitman and all asked their subjects who, who always agreed that that's more natural than the building is near the bicycle. They asked their subjects things like, well, would you ever say the building is near the bicycle? And they got all kinds of cute answers, um, including cases, cases like this one, where you might have a famous bicycle statue in the square. Um, and yeah, and they would also say, well, if you have a big statue of a bicycle and a little garage on wheels going around it, then you can say the garage is next to the bicycle. Or one they liked especially, well, if I parked my bicycle somewhere and somebody built a garage next to it while I was gone. <laughs> Um, uh, the man is tied to the tree. We now picture this sentence and it's, and it's reversed. The man is tied to the tree. Well, that sounds like something like this. Pictures by dear Henry Gleitman. Yeah. Uh, the tree is tied to the man. Well, you might picture something like that. You, you tend to want a littler tree, right? So you could tie it to the man. Uh, so the asymmetry of the syntactic structure of all of these sentences is playing a role. Um, it's, not, it's not the verbs by themselves that are asymmetrical in any, uh, that are not being symmetrical. It's the structures they're in. Uh, and and the, in a way that the most definitive test that Gleitman and her colleagues performed was putting in nonsense words for the arguments of the predicate. So something like the zup matches the riff with invented nonsense words. And they, they gave subject sentences like that. And then they asked them interesting questions like uh, which, if the zup is similar to the riff or the zup met the riff or the zup married the riff, which is older or younger? I mean, these are things the sentence clearly doesn't say anything about, but just, just guess, which do you think is bigger, less, mobile, etc. And people had people were willing to, to express judgments on those properties. And it turned out very reliably that the one in the second position, when you say the zup is similar to the riff, this is being taken as somehow the reference object or the ground in a figure ground kind of kind of uh, uh, interpretation. And so the zup, the, the one that's second, is generally considered more important, more famous older, bigger, and more immobile. I mean, the, the mobility one, it, it, goes, it goes in the opposite direction, yeah. But yeah, more immobile. Um, now about symmetry and reciprocality. Symmetrical kissing as expressed in John and Mary kissed is always one event. And it's an event in which the two participants are co-participating, equally agentive, et cetera. Uh, John and Mary kiss each other, that can often be two events. Um, not necessarily, but can be. Those were not by, done by Henry, but they were done by one of their students in a Henry Gleitman-like style. Um, it takes two to shake hands. That's, that's intrinsically symmetrical. That's um, James Comey, the FBI director that Trump was trying so hard to get rid of. Um, but a hug may be unrequited. Trump was trying to get him in a, yeah, Comey was not re reciprocating. Um, so the experiment with the nonsense words showed that subjects know something about the zup and the riff, which previously had no meaning from where they were in the structure of the sentence. The riff in complement position, where it's understood as the ground or reference point, is more often judged larger, older, et cetera. And in sum, what they found was that the appearance of non-symmetry in Tversky's findings was an illusion. It was a matter of putting a symmetric predicate into an asymmetric syntactic frame. And notice, this is a Lila sentence. Notice that as usual, language design as we know it is profoundly efficient, exhibiting the ability to express more than one kind of information with the same structure. The positioning of noun phrases tells us who bears what relation to whom, and at the same time conveys a different sort of dominance 
among members of a category expressed by something like figure ground perspective. So now let's look into synthesizing the logical and the linguistic perspectives on symmetry. The logical definitions and the linguistic litmus tests for classifying lexical predicates as symmetrical or not do not make identical distinctions. Meet, similar, sibling, they're symmetrical on both criteria. But kiss, hug, opposed to, or friend, they're linguistically symmetrical. You can say John and Mary kissed, et cetera. Um, but they're not, they're not uh, logically symmetrical because John kissed Mary does not entail that Mary kissed John. So they're in the plus minus logical class. The logical definitions have their roots in mathematics and their value is generally measured in terms of their mathematical applications, which are many all over many fields of mathematics and elsewhere. The litmus test re rests on a combination of morphological, syntactic, and semantic properties of an intransitive variant of a two-place predicate. Its value is measured by linguistic explanatory power. Our ambition is to forge a perspective on these notions that draws on both approaches and to show that this enriched perspective can be useful in shedding light on the role of symmetry in linguistic and conceptual structure. Initially restricting attention to English, consider the behavior of verbs and other predicates on those two kinds of criteria. Logically, are they symmetrical, asymmetrical, or in the mixed plus minus class? And linguistically, do they pass the linguistic litmus test for symmetricals or not? In principle, that could give us six classes, three by two. But no predicate is both logically fully symmetrical and linguistically asymmetrical, except for the recalcitrant verb resemble. But I learned long ago from Ed Keenan and others, when there's just a small finite number of exceptions to some big open generalization, you can leave the exceptions for further separate study right? or ignore them. Right? <laughs> Um, so, so there are actually only four classes, the, the um, linguistically symmetrical or not, and logically are, the, are they pure symmetrical, sorry, I'm not saying it right, logically are they pure symmetrical or asymmetrical or are they plus minus, right? So we've mentioned the two subclasses of linguistic symmetricals, the meet similar sibling class and the kiss hug friend class. The linguistic asymmetricals, which fail the litmus test, are also of two kinds, logically. Some of them, like be supportive of, be an admirer of, are in the plus minus mixed class. Uh, and others, like father or taller, are logically fully asymmetrical. Next slide shows the resulting classification. So in the first column, we name the classes, pure symmetricals, mixed symmetricals, Mixed asymmetricals, pure asymmetricals. And the linguistic property, the litmus test, just classifies them as symmetrical or asymmetrical. And the logical property is either symmetrical, mixed, or asymmetrical. And the mixed ones divide across the linguistically symmetrical ones and the linguistically asymmetrical ones. So that's how we get the four classes. Um, and you see examples, I've talked most about examples in the first two classes. And then mixed asymmetricals are ones like love. We don't say John and Mary love. We have things like are in love or something, but not with the, not with the verb love. Um, or we, uh, we don't say John and Bill hit. Uh, but, but if John loves Mary, Mary may or may not love John. And if John hits Bill, Bill may or may not hit John. So they're they're, they're logically mixed, but linguistically, they don't act like symmetricals. And the pure asymmetricals are asymmetrical on both criteria. So things like outrank, contain, father, taller than, below. One tricky issue that arises when one considers the properties of eventive verbs in our chart, like meet, marry, kiss, hug, drown, hit, outrun, is the question of how many events there are asserted to be in the case of different constructions with the different verbs. Um, we'll briefly state our hypotheses on this topic without much argument. We could come back to it in discussion if you want. I could just skip this whole slide, but that I, I got at least mention it, I think. So with the pure symmetricals like marry, 
an event of Pat marrying Chris is always also an event of Chris marrying Pat. There's just one event there. So Pat and Chris married each other. If you, even if you put that explicit reciprocal on, still entails Pat and Chris married. Uh, the construction doesn't make that entailment. The reciprocal sentences in general don't entail the, what we call the symmetrical sentences, but it's a lexical entailment of the verb marry. Mixed symmetricals like kiss and hug don't have that entailment as we saw in the pictures. Uh, Chris and Pat kissed asserts the existence of a single event, uh, but Chris and Pat kissed each other doesn't tell you whether there was one event or more than one event. And you notice that you could add on different days to the one with each other. And you couldn't to the Chris and Pat kissed unless you then meant multiple mutual kissings. Right. Um, okay, so, so you can do uh, on different days fine with Chris and Pat kissed each other, but not with, not with Chris and Pat married each other. Chris and Pat married each other on different days. Doesn't work. There had to have been just one event. So what do we say about the mixed asymmetricals, drown, kill, and hit? By the litmus test, they're asymmetrical, but logically in full sentences, they seem to be plus minus and explicit reciprocals are okay. I mean, it's, it's, it's hard to set up a, a reciprocal drowning, but not impossible. John and Bill drowned each other. But when we conceive of an act of A drowning B, that generally seems to be conceived as an asymmetrical act, as GGMO noted. Does the possibility of a symmetrical instance arise only at the level of a full sentence, which might be expressing two different events? Analysis offered in Champollion helps make good sense of the situation. This is a detail you can skip if you like. Um, that the idea is a lexical verb such as drown, what it says it predicates of a situation that there's an event of drowning in it. So the verb itself is not asymmetrical because a situation that contains an event of John drowning Bill can also contain an event of Bill drowning John. And those can be conceived as two sub events of a larger event, just as we often think of plurals like John and Bill as denoting a complex entity that has the two individual entities as parts. But with a pure asymmetrical like outrun, a reciprocal sentence is grammatical, but it can only possibly be true if it's understood as it referring to different events like different races. If Chris and Pat outran each other, that cannot be happening in a single event. Okay. Um, so now this question of graded judgments, although we're not invoking a graded notion of lexical symmetry, um, we, we had seen these gradedness of judgments among participants in Gleitman et al's pretest, on which people were simply asked to rate on a five point scale how symmetrical they considered a given verb to be, a given predicate to be. And it's on the next slide. And the results in that table do correlate with linguistically symmet symmetrical behavior and with the four classes in the table that I gave you. All 20 of the predicates that are ranked below the midline in the table I'll show you in a minute are indeed linguistically asymmetrical and all 20 above the line are indeed linguistically symmetrical. I won't spend a lot of time on, on the actual uh, things that they, they noticed there are a lot of caveats with this, with these judgments because they didn't even say which, which syntactic category you should consider these predicates to belong to. And since English is morphologically so impoverished, you often can't tell the difference between a noun and a verb. In, in such cases. But the ones that are highest, like equal, identical, marry, those are the ones that are purely symmetrical. And the ones that are lowest tend to be the ones that are purely asymmetrical and, and similarly in between. We also note that one can distinguish necessarily symmetrical predicates from empirically symmetrical predicates. Uh, and likewise for the asymmetricals by saying that a a relation is necessarily symmetrical if its symmetry follows from an explicit definition or axiomatization of the relation. Uh, so, so something like love, you know, nothing in the definition tells you whether it's symmetrical or not. That's that's an empirical fact that it's it's a mixed uh, mixed symmetrical. Um, but 
but something like equal and identical from when you analyze what they mean they they have to be they have to be symmetrical uh, and and the ones that are necessarily symmetrical those two are rated highest of all and the two and the two predicates that are necessarily asymmetrical better and less and all comparatives really um, are rated among the very lowest. So now, now we've, we've done something to integrate the logical and the linguistic perspective, but now to go farther, we've got to integrate the lexicon and the syntax because the sentence, sentence structure is making a contribution in addition to what the lexicon um, provides. So we saw that the logical definition, the linguistic definition gave different partitions of English predicates. And we established a finer grain classification of those predicates, combining the two systems. In this section, we argue that interpreting full sentences also requires synthesizing contributions from different sources, the compositional interpretation of the basic truth conditional meaning on the one hand, and the further influence of syntactic structure, or of the choice of using one syntactic structure rather than another where there's a choice on the other aspects of interpretation, like figure ground structure or what's taken as a reference point. We don't so far have an actual formal account, but the ideas we describe here are influenced by a number of sources, including the work by Gleitman et al. in 96, and Doughty's work on thematic proto-roles, and Yoad Winter's work on hard and soft entailments, and Rubinstein's work on groups in the semantics of symmetricals and others. We'll illustrate our ideas by working through an interesting challenge to compositionality that came um, kind of unwittingly from a paper by Barbara Landau and Lila Gleitman on symmetricals in asymmetrical structures. So I start with a long quote from, from Landau and Gleitman. This, this sets up the background of the, of the problem. So they write, if two bodies collide, then the first of them collides with the second, the second collides with the first, and they collide with each other. Surprisingly, assenting to these mutual entailments does not imply that these sentence forms are semantically equivalent, at least in a court of law. For if a scooter collides with a bus, then the scooter's insurance company pays and the reverse obtains if the bus collides with the scooter. Although any collision must be a single event, the asymmetry of syntactic structure in these cases imparts a further semantic element to the interpretation. Of course, if the bus and the scooter collide, or the scooter and the bus collide, that is simply a tragic accident, and money does not change hands. This set of syntactic structures is a striking case whereby even a single symmetrical motion event colliding can be linguistically framed so as to alter the relative prominence of the participants resulting in additional interpretive values of path direction and even as in the present case attributions of instigation and cause so the puzzle on the one hand we agree with those observations they're all intuitively totally plausible and they provide a good example of relevant further aspects of meaning. On the other hand, we seem dangerously close to inconsistency. Let's label the key example sentences so we can refer to them. So 10A, the scooter collides with the bus, call that the scooter sentence. 10B, the bus collides with the scooter, that's the bus sentence. 10C, the bus and the scooter collide, that's the bus and scooter sentence. How can one reconcile the following assumptions which Landau and Gleitman make, and which we have also been making so far. Assumption 11a, the word collide has the same meaning in all of these sentences. Assumption b, the intransitive variant, the bus and scooter sentence, entails the conjunction of the bus sentence and the scooter sentence. And c, the two transitive variants, the scooter sentence and the bus sentence, are not semantically equivalent to each other or to the intransitive variant the bus and scooter sense. That doesn't quite look consistent, right? What's the problem? Well, given the, different, given the stated differences in culpability in the case of the scooter sentence and the bus sentence, it would seem that when the scooter sentence is true, the bus sentence is not. 
These seem to be truth conditional, truth conditional differences given the consequences in a court of law as to who pays. But if the two transitive sentence, sentences are truth conditionally incompatible, how can the symmetrical sentence entail both of them? That is, how can we make good on Gleitman and Landau's statement that assenting to these mutual entailments does not imply that these sentence forms are semantically equivalent? Well, we'll offer a solution building both on Gleitman et al's work and a modification of Dowdy's ideas about thematic proto roles and argument selection. So Dowdy rejected the idea that there's a fixed set of distinct thematic roles like agent and patient, and instead identifies, among other things, a set of proto-agent properties, properties like volition, sentience, causation, movement, et cetera, and proto-patient properties, change of state being an incremental theme, being causally affected, being relatively stationary. And he, he formulated a subject selection principle. This is not for an individual selecting what's gonna be the subject of a sentence, but for the language selecting for a given verb, which argument is going to be its subject. Uh, so the argument for which the verb entails the greater number of proto-agent properties will be lexicalized as its subject. So Dowdy observes that with state of pure symmetricals like rhyme, intersect, be similar, neither argument has any proto-agent properties. For mixed symmetricals like hug and kiss, he notes that only the intransitive collective like John and Mary hugged entails that both parties were volitionally involved. He observes in contrast that for the non-state of pure symmetricals like married, both arguments, even of the transitive variant have proto-agent properties. Both must be actively and volitionally involved. So there's differences among these different verbs in this respect. And in this case, um, in, in the case of ones like married, the lexical semantics of the verbs requires the two arguments, even in the transitive case, to have equal proto-agent properties. Dowdy also discusses the verb collide, for which the judgments he assumes are that in the intransitive collective form, the bus and the scooter collided, both of the conjoined subjects must be in motion. Whereas in the transitive form, motion is entailed only for the subject. Landau and Gleitman thought motion of both parties was always entailed. This is something people have disagreed about. Um, but I think Dowdy's, Dowdy's judgment is the dominant one in the, in the literature. Uh, so so uh, for, for the transitive sentences, neither volition nor causation is entailed by either argument of collide. Um, he, he, he notes the situation of the truck collided with the lamppost and the seemingly odd, the lamppost, the, the truck and the lamppost collided. Uh, his 36B might seem like a bizarre sentence, but in fact, it would be perfectly natural for a situation where a new lamppost was being carried to the top of a hill and it came loose from where it was tied on the truck, rolled down the hill and crossed the path of a moving truck at the bottom. Um, so the difference is that 36A, the truck collided with the lamppost is perfectly natural because it entails only that the truck was moving. But 36B is not so natural because it entails that both of them were in motion. So you have to have a funny story to make that one okay. Dowdy assumes polysemy. You notice that Lightman and, Lightman and Landau and, and we in our joint paper were assuming that these verbs had a single meaning and could occur in a range of constructions. But Dowdy assumes polysemy, transitive and intransitive hug are two different but related verbs. Uh, we, we have been following Gleitman et al. in treating transitive and intransitive hug as one underspecified lexical item, which can fit into two different syntactic frames with the choice of syntactic structure, sometimes resulting in further semantic and or pragmatic content. Our, our, I can tell you one thing about the reviewers of our article. They wish we would go with Dowdy and go with polysemy. They don't understand how we can make things work without polysemy. But this is a problem because it was a light, it was Lila Gleitman that was favoring the 
non-polysemy account. And I have to channel Lila while working on how to reply to the referees. OK. Um, but an important ingredient in both Dowdy's work and Gleitman et al is that a given aspect of meaning, such as this participant is in motion, or this participant plays a causal role in the event, may arise either from the semantics of the verb or indirectly as a result of the choice of one syntactic structure or another. Uh, and the referees have, have mentioned to us that, that they were not the first to make that observation. Uh, okay, so, so for example, Compare the volitional component of meaning in these two pairs, one with hug, uh, which entails volition only for the subject, and one with tango, which lexically entails volition for both. So John and Mary hugged. In that case, both must be volitional. Mary hugged John. Well, that one only entails that Mary must be volitionally involved. Fred and Ginger tangoed. Both must be volitional. Ginger tangoed with Fred still both must be volitional because you can't tango without both being volitionally involved. Uh, so, so it's clear that this, what we talk about is the effect of syntax on meaning is much bigger for the plus minus class like hug than for the pure symmetricals. Now we can solve the collide puzzle, kind of. So let's say with Dowdy that the core meaning common to all literal, literal physical, I'm not going into metaphor, all literal physical uses of collide says a collide event involves the impact of two objects or more, but let's stick to two, at least one of which, at least one of which was moving. The core lexical meaning says nothing about causation or volition. The symmetrical construction requires that the conjoined NPs have the same proto-agent properties because they're both subject and subject position. So that entails that they're both in motion because at least one of them must be and they have to have the same properties. And it may say no more than that. It doesn't have to say anything about causation or volition. The transitive construction prefers that the subject has more proto-agent properties than the complement. Hence, either the complement wasn't moving at all or they were both moving and the subject was causer, say. And in either case, the subject is the one considered to be at fault. The use, this is an important pragmatic part, the use of one or the other construction in any setting where these differences could matter will give rise to an implicature that such a difference was intended by the speaker. And a court of law is a setting where such differences definitely matter. The first sentence in the Landau and Gleitman passage is in the context of logic the 2000 year tradition about what it is for a predicate to be symmetrical. There's universal quantification over all instantiations of the given predicate, predications, and no particular event is being described. Hence only what all such events have in common is relevant. One abstracts away from the language user and hence from pragmatics when one explicates the logical properties of symmetrical predicates, including the principle that the collective intransitive entails the two transitive variants. But then in the context of the court of law, where the choice of how, how a given individual event is described is deliberate, then the syntax of the three different sentences does make contributions to the enriched meaning, contributions of the kind described by Gleitman et al., made more specific in this case with elements of Dowdy's proto-role ideas to explain which which elements of meaning get added to the one that's put in subject position. Work remains to make the relevant principles more precise and to work out the division of labor between semantics and pragmatics, which we've been a bit vague about. So then the last section, uh, yep, yeah, the last section, uh, we ask how semantic properties such as symmetry arise in the life of languages and their learner users. For this kind of conceptual category, the puzzle of acquisition is particularly acute. It's bad enough, this is Lila's nice language. Whenever, whenever it gets very literate, it's Lila. Right? Uh, bad enough, for example, that concrete words like doggy are often uttered in the absence of dogs and sometimes remain unuttered in the presence of dogs but at least the child may get some help from perception for doggy. Whereas for abstract words like 
fair, as in that's not fair or not. Right? There's nothing in the perceptual world that will help. Syntax can provide important constraints and clues for the learner in the typical language learning situation. But what happens if a child is not surrounded by received language? This is the case of the emergent language, Nicaraguan sign language, that, that luckily emerged with linguists very soon or around to document in, in great detail. Um, thumbnail, thumbnail, tiny history of it. Uh, before the first school for, for deaf kids, there were just individual deaf kids often with hearing parents who didn't know any sign language. And they were inventing sign systems, which, are, which is what we call home sign, scattered. And then 1975 was the first cohort of kids in this school, and they would all travel together by bus. And even though in the school, the teachers were, were trying to actually discourage sign language and wanted to teach oral language, the kids on the bus were signing away like mad and, and also in school whenever <laughs> they had a chance. So then there was a second cohort, third cohort studied by linguists and, and, and it was impossible to stop the development of this rich uh, sign language, Nicaraguan sign language. So this language evolved by children is suggested for the unlearned character of some kinds of form meaning mappings. And, and Nicaraguan sign language displays event structure in a particularly revealing way that's relevant to these issues about the intransitive symmetrical versus transitive sentences in a reciprocal, transitive verbs in a reciprocal construction. So in Nicaraguan sign language, you can say a woman hit a ball in a pretty basic way, but you can't say a ball hit a woman. They have these animacy hierarchies as many languages do. And you can't say a man hit a woman when they're equal on the hierarchy. To say a man hit a woman, you, you say something that I will paraphrase as man hit, woman got hit. So you separate the, what the agent did and what the patient experienced. Um, and that, that then gets kind of condensed into man, woman, hit, got hit. And let's see if we can see this on the video in the next slide. Ah, it's happening by itself, but woman hit, got hit. Let me play it once more if I can. So first, first there's a sign that signifies man, then there's a sign that signifies woman, then there's the hit, and then there's the got hit. Go back, go back. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Man, woman, hit, got hit. Um, and so, so uh, Gleitman and some colleagues recently did, did experiments with Nicaraguan sign language signers. And they did experiments to try to tease apart whether think situations that looked symmetrical would always be conceptualized as symmetrical or whether there was a noticeable difference between reciprocal versus simple symmetrical. So for reciprocal, they thought about cases where John and Mary punch each other. So there's a, there's a transitive action and the other one is doing a transitive action and they may be doing those actions at the same time. So the picture may look symmetrical. On the other hand, with a verb like high five, which is a symmetrical verb, always involves two, uh, two individuals and has this well, if, if I report on some two people high-fiving, I will, I will set them in signing space and then use a, use a symmetrical two-handed um, sign to say that they high-fived. So a picture of high-fiving is really construed as a single symmetrical event. So let's see if I've got videos for that. Uh, ah, oh, so yeah, so in, in English, yeah, I'll say what you're going to see. In English, we say a man, a woman and a man punch each other to describe the two, two transitive events happening reciprocally. In NSL, they say something like woman, man, and then they, they do a cross punch uh, for the, what, the, what the puncher did, and then got punched, got punched for what the two punchies <laughs> received. 
So here's punch each other, woman, man. The two of them crossed, punch, got punched. Okay, I won't repeat it. And then with the pure symmetrical, like in English, a man and a woman meet. It's similar in NSL, man, woman, and then the symmetrical sign meet. That's it. So when you ask whether symmetricals like uh, meet or high five are expressed with a single verb with none of these got done, something done to, they call that recoil um, or not. With the symmetricals, there's very rarely a recoil verb uh, present like the got hit. And with the reciprocals like punch and tick tickle, there's very often the yellow bar a recoil verb uh, with it. And this, was, this is true even with those early cohorts. The home signers look a little bit messy, but home sign, I mean, those were just single individuals. So I, would, I, don't, I don't understand that slide, forget that part. But, but the cohorts one, two, and three, uh, all of them have this, this big difference between few recoil verbs with the symmetricals, many with the reciprocals. So the results showed that not all symmetrical looking bi-directional events, that is some may be like high-fiving and others may be like punching each other. Not all of them are represented using mirroring, using, using sort of single two-armed um, verbs. When two people punch each other, the event can look symmetrical, but the mirrored form is used primarily for events that are abstractly construed as symmetrical, a single event like high-fiving in which two participants act as one. And, and such, such verbs, such forms were not used for two simultaneous reciprocal events. All signers, even home signers have this intuition and thus make a distinction between symmetrical and reciprocal construals of events at the word level. At the sentence level, Verbs describing bi-directional events with punch or tickle are produced with those serial verb constructions I was showing you like punch, get punched, which are transitive constructions for the NSL signers. And verbs describing symmetrical events like high five or meet are rarely produced in serial verb constructions, signaling that they're not typically construed as transitive. Signers, no matter what their year of entry into the deaf community displayed this pattern. So in summary, Gleitman et al. note that the remarkable fact that both English speakers and NSL signers distinguish between symmetricals, one event involving a collective agent described by one non-transitive clause, and reciprocals, two events involving two agents described by two transitive clauses, or one complex serial verb construction. These findings taken together suggest a common core of conceptual distinctions and grammatical means for the foundational formal property of symmetry. The fact that the sameness is found under radically different input conditions highlights that unlearned forces are at work in the design of language. Perhaps we've failed to discover how this discussion, how this distinction is learned. I forgot to mention that the psychologists have looked for when when an understanding of symmetrical constructions in languages like English emerges in kids and they go down as far as they can do experiments on them at all down to about age three or four. And they, they find the distinction there clearly enough and they can't, they haven't been able to desi design useful experiments for younger than that. So they can't tell when it emerges. So this suggestion is maybe they can't, they haven't found how they learn it because it, maybe it was there from the beginning prefigured in the conceptual underpinnings that make language acquisition possible. So in conclusion, the arguments in this paper all have a common core consisting of the following two observations. First, that the logical characterization of symmetry in one has wide application and presumably reflects the laws of thought and natural languages do not violate that logic. I mean, Tversky seemed to think that logic had this notion, but natural language doesn't. And second, that human languages have evolved so as to render remarkably efficiently 
an enormous panoply of further distinctions reflected both in vocabulary and in syntax. Both formalisms and patriotism are satisfied when we declare that all humans are created equal. That's a Lila sentence, right? Uh, but something more is communicated when we remark that the least of the citizens is equal to the president or the reverse. Symmetry is part of the lexical semantics of many predicates, but it's never the only part. And the syntactic structure of sentences can also make its own contributions. So the solutions proposed here to the puzzles posed by symmetricals, while still very incomplete, all have the form of integrating the contributions to meaning of lexicon and syntax. A given aspect of meaning may come from either, since a lexical predicate in a given language may be specified or unspecified for some semantic feature or property that an asymmetric, asymmetric syntactic structure can in principle contribute. Syntax contributes the structure that supports semantic composition and also the structure that determines asymmetric prominence among the arguments of a predicate. Symmetry in language and notably in the emergent language, Nicaraguan sign language, supports the view that the learning or language creating child must go beyond perception to structural features of language to discover or invent unobservable aspects of word meaning and understand how those meanings are enriched by the syntactic structures in which they occur. And I believe that's the end. There's a few references.